Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You may know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons of the Seventh Adventist Church, and uh, this particular lesson is part of this series on the teachings of Jesus, which we're studying in the months of July, August, and September of 2014. This is the final lesson in, in that series, and you might guess that it's talking about the second coming of Jesus. It's a message that's really pretty dear and close to the hearts of Adventists, since Adventist means the second coming, and that's part of our name. So we should have some interesting things to say about that subject, and I hope you'll join us in this discussion. But before we begin, let's uh, begin with the word of prayer. We need the Holy Spirit's guidance as we look over this material. Our kind and loving Father, with great appreciation we think of the time when you will come again. We realize that if you hadn't come the first, if you didn't plan to come the second time, there would have been really no reason for you to come the first time. And so we know, along with your many verbal promises, that that day is still ahead of us, but it seems, as we look around us, that it can't be very far. We hope that it will be soon, and that all of us will be a part of that wonderful day as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The promise, or promises, if you like, of the second coming. And some of the details about what we should expect, what we have seen already, and unfortunately, also, the reasons for the delay of the second coming of Jesus Christ will be the subject of our discussion together. You remember that when Jesus ascended from somewhere on the top of the Mount of Olives, what did he first, what did he say as he was just leaving his disciples? You remember, I'm sorry, what did the two angels say who came down to speak to them just after he left? What did they say? He will come again. Acts 1, 11, this same Jesus which you have seen go up into heaven will so come in like manner, for use the King James Version, in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. That's a pretty, pretty physical, obvious kind of coming, wasn't it? I mean, there he went, you know? He will come back down the same way. Well, the second coming, some intrepid scholars have decided, is mentioned 300 times in the New Testament. And as we mentioned, it's part of our name. But unfortunately, it has now been how long? Almost, we're about four weeks short, 170 years since the great disappointment in 18, well, October 22 of 1844. What does that say to us about the promise, the hope, and the delay of the second coming? Did God plan for 170 years? Now, I, I didn't say, did God know? I said, did God plan for 170 years of delay? Do we have any indication that he knew it was coming? It was predicted. Yeah, we have several parables that clearly talk about a delay, don't we? Mm -hmm. The obvious one that people know about is the parable of the ten virgins, right? There and others in that chapter. Um, are, are we asleep because of this long delay? Is the Adventist church worldwide now asleep? I'll say yes. It sounds like you all are pretty close to being asleep. <laughs> no, I, I, but what does the parable say? It says we are all asleep. That's what the parable says. Now, we're exactly where we are in time relative to the parable. Of course, I don't know. But all of those virgins were asleep. Not one of them was awake. No one was watching. No one was vigilant. They were all sleeping. Well, that was prior to 1844. I see. <clears throat> well, I think that that probably doesn't apply just to before 1844. We're, 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 we're the, the five virgins that were awake. There weren't any that were awake. No, there were not any that were. They were all sleeping. Five had some extra oil, but none of them were awake. Yes. Maybe so. the reason for the delay is because we're asleep. 
So what does it take to wake up? That's a good question. Well, That's one of the things we're going to try to struggle with in this lesson. What happened in the parable to wake him up? Well, what happened in the parable is a trumpet sounded and the bridegroom was showed up. Well, who... That's a little who, late. <laughs> who blew the trumpet? Presumably the people accompanying the bridegroom. Which stands for... And what, what does that stand well, for in the parable? Well, I'm, I'm not going to answer that right now because we're going to, we're going to touch that in this lesson. Okay. So just bear with me. In the, in the first coming, were there conditions that had to be met? Or could he just pick any old time he wanted to come for that? No, were there were very... Read the first couple of chapters of Desire of Ages. There were definite conditions. I don't know if you would say met, but there were definite conditions that made it really necessary for him to come at so that did, point. So <clears throat> could he have come before that time? Could the people prior to that, the God's people prior to that, could they have done certain things or created well, a, whatever you, environment needed to be created so that the... If you look at the prophecies from the Old Testament in carefully, particularly the book of Daniel, and then you look at the sequence of events that were happening around the birth of Jesus and around his crucifixion and so forth, the, that lifespan. There was a, I, I haven't sat down to calculate it exactly, but there was a, like a maybe 20 or 30 year window, not more than that. According to the predictions, if you follow all those predictions carefully, Jesus' life had to fit there. Not more. So it's not... It wasn't the condition of the the people didn't have to get ready for that. They didn't have to prepare or be receptive like we think well, we need to be for the second coming here. I mean, uh, I mean, how do how can you say they clearly were not ready at the first coming? But God had carefully predicted pretty precisely what was going to happen at the point when he would come. So God wasn't asleep. He, was, he knew exactly what was going on. But the people had all their, all their ideas mixed up. Ephesians 1.10, the fullness of time. Mm -hmm. you know, but if God is a teacher, then it's, to me it's, it's easier to understand rather than because uh, these lessons have to be learned and mm -hmm. conditions have to be such that the lessons have meaning. Yeah, Galatians... 4 verse 4 in it that says at the right time God sent his son is it is it 4 verse 4 somewhere right in but there but when the time had fully come yeah that's parallel to Ephesians yeah. 110 yeah okay well let's come back to our lesson here um, as soon as I press the right button so what, what stands between us and that precious date? In the upper room, Jesus made it very clear. I mean, he promised, didn't he? And there's, I mean, look at John 14. This is the famous promise. There he is. He's with, it's the last night of his ministry here on this earth. He's talking to his best friends, the disciples, and he says, do not be worried and upset. Jesus told them, believe in God and believe also in me. There are many rooms in my father's house, and I am going to prepare a place for you. I would not tell you this, would not tell you this if it were not so. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself so that you will be where I am. You know the way that leads to the place where I'm going and so forth. So, I mean, when God speaks in those very kind of certain terms, that ought to be a pretty firm kind of promise, wouldn't you think? And he always speaks in very optimistic, very certain terms when he talks about his second coming. Can we trust him? I, it's a little difficult for me to say, can God be trusted? But you know there's a famous book by that title. Well, there are a number of prophecies given in the Old Testament, and some in the New Testament, that we call conditional prophecies. Now we Adventists, we, we take those, we, we talk about conditional prophecies when someone brings up these prophecies that don't seem to. I mean, look at the last, those final chapters in Ezekiel. 
that huge temple that he predicted would be built. Has that ever been built? No. And there are a number of other prophecies that we call conditional prophecies. Now, how are you supposed to sort out between the prophecies that are certain and guaranteed and the prophecies which are only conditional? People of Jesus' time had a hard enough time figuring out that they weren't all, all the prophecies weren't all referring to his first coming. Mm -hmm. In fact, yeah. they didn't know that there was a difference between the first and second coming. The ones that are fulfilled <coughs> um, weren't conditional. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the, that. The ones yeah. that didn't pan out, those great, were conditional. Great, uh, great <laughs> insight. Well, why did he say he was coming back, or why is he coming back? There's a famous verse here in Matthew 16, and this is right after Peter and Jesus had that discussion about who he was. For the Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then, what's he going to do? He will reward each one according to his deeds. Does that include the wicked as well as the righteous? Of course. There's a famous verse that we know many, Ecclesiastes 12, 14, about he's going to judge everyone, knowing even the secret things. But I'm going to read a slightly different one, Revelation 22, verse 12. Listen, says Jesus, I am coming soon, I will bring my rewards with me, to give each one according to what he has done. Isn't that pretty clear? How do we, well, I mean, according to what we've done. So that means um, what kind of rewards do we deserve? Do any of us deserve eternal life? No. Not in and of really? ourselves. No. Not in and of ourselves. So what does he mean according to what we have done? <coughs> Well, what we do tells everybody who we are. Okay. You want to spell that out a little bit more? Well, how do I know anybody here, yeah. what they do, without, I mean, I look at them and find out what they do, and I can tell who they are. And what we are <clears throat> is manifested in our works, which is kind of spooky, actually. <laughs> it is. <laughs> kind of... Uh, threatening. Notice at the end of the parable about the wedding feast, Matthew 22 verses 11 thir to 13 say, the king went in to look at the guests and saw a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. Now we need to stop here for a moment and explain some things. The king is inviting who to his wedding? The wedding of his son? At this time he'd invited everyone people off of the streets. He says, compel them to come in. So, did they come wearing all their very rich, fancy robes? They didn't have rich, fancy robes. So what did the king do? He provided robes. He provided perfect, wonderful clothing for everybody who walked through the door. They were, the clothing was provided. So that's an important <coughs> part of this discussion. So now he says, friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? I mean, you know, he'd stick out like a sore thumb, right? The king asked him, but the man said nothing. Then the king told the servants, tie him up hand and foot and throw him outside in the dark. There he will grind, cry, and grind his teeth. And Jesus concluded, many are invited, but few are chosen. That's a little scary. So what does that tell us? Well, yeah, what does it tell us? It means that had, when, he, when, he, when the king went around and said, you don't belong in here, was that before, during, or after the wedding feast? It was, it was probably during, but, but why? Well, why what's, what's the... Probably um, at the beginning, more likely at the beginning. What's the significance of not having something on anyway? Well, let's think about that. What I, I know what it is with a wedding, but okay. But wait, so, is, there, in, is, in is the feast before the wedding or after the wedding? Well, as far as we know, the wedding feast. You see, in those days, it was it was not a ceremony and then a wedding feast. It was a thing that went on for like a week, and everybody came and you ate, and then there was various things went on, and then you ate some more, and it was a big to do. So. 
you wouldn't wait for this guy with the wrong kind of clothes on to stand around for a day or two before you throw him out. I'm sure the king came along and said, is everything ready? Yeah. How come that guy didn't have any, the right clothes on? Get him out of here. I'm sure that was at the beginning. And they locked the gates and the doors. And sure, exactly. And so that implies that what? There's going to be some kind of an evaluation before the wedding starts, right? The righteous are to be taken to heaven, you know, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, and the wicked are to perish. That's 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 to 10. Pretty clear. The righteous will be saved because of their trust in God, their willingness to do His will, and the transformation that has taken place in their lives through the work of the Holy Spirit. And that process has a one-word name. What do we call it? One of those long names? No. They answered, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your family. <coughs> it, the one word that describes that process really is faith. If you talk about justification by faith, sanctification by faith, salvation by faith, righteousness by faith, which part do we do? We don't do the justification, we don't do the sanctification, we don't do the righteousness, we don't do any of that. The only thing we can do is trust God. The part we do is faith. Okay? God does the rest. So when we have these big long arguments about, well, how much is justification, what's required to work, that's God's part. Why are we arguing about His part? He, he's going to do His part. We need to be concerned about our part. Well, well, it sounds like there's going to be some people that won't have faith. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them. How how does a person go out and sort them all out? You've got faith. You don't have faith. You stand over here. Well, and and you can answer that question for me. Can you tell that? Um, can you look at us and tell which ones of us have faith and which ones don't? <coughs> Maybe. You know how I would. You're, you're much. Was? Yeah. I, I would say by what they do. We just a answered a well, question. I'm, yeah. Okay. Because if you people watch do long, things because yeah. of faith. If you watch for long enough, you might be able to figure it out, but you can't tell just by looking. Well, in the judgment, um, aren't we going to go over okay. everybody's life? And that's how you kind of find out who has faith. Well, God is going to do that before we, before we become involved. How about if I'm good most of the time? But isn't you, it isn't <laughs> more, it's this combination of <coughs> is an internal, our own Christian growth while we're here, uh -huh. and then in relation to that, what you do to help others or love your neighbor. There's a, there's a dual thing got to go on here. Yeah. And yes, there is. Yeah. I was going to say, you, you really can't tell because it, it's where God says, a, a man looks on the outward appearance and he looks on the heart. Yeah. There's some things you can't totally figure out. One of the things that I've heard discussed, Myra. Well, I'm still going back to the wedding feast because frequently that's looked at as why is God so harsh? Mm -hmm. you know, just throw him out because he doesn't have the right clothes on. But if you look at it as, as the second coming and those that want to be in heaven, to be in heaven, but don't want to be there for the right reasons. Yeah. I mean, yeah. If, if you walk into the door of the wedding feast and they offer you these beautiful clothes provided by the I king. I just want to be there. I don't want to put those clothes on. You don't, want to be, you don't want to be a part of the group. Well, there's been a lot of discussion among Adventists, and I've been in a number of these discussions myself, about how you can tell, because Matthew 24 says there's going to be false prophets and false messiahs, false Christ, coming before the true Messiah returns, the true Christ returns, right? So how do we know whether this is a false one or a true one? If so, we somebody, someone just descended, we, we walked out here and we saw someone coming down, how would we know? This is something Adventists need to know, right? It doesn't match up to what the Bible tells you. Okay, well, here's, here's the clue, and I think if we read this, it shouldn't be any question in our minds. It's found in our handout, and by the way, if those of you who are listening want to look at the materials that we use, they're available on our website at 
Theox, that's T H E O X dot O R G. That's T H E O X dot O R G. And this is number eight in our handout. 13. Oh, number eight, yeah. Soon there appears in the east a small black cloud, about half the size of a man's hand. It is a cloud which surrounds the Savior and which seems to, in the distance to be shrouded in darkness. The people of God know this to be the sign of the Son of Man. In solemn silence, they gaze upon it as it draws nearer the earth, becoming lighter and more glorious, until it is a great white cloud, its base a glory like consuming fire and above it the rainbow of the covenant. Jesus rides forth as a mighty conqueror, and then dropping down a little bit, with anthems of celestial melody, the holy angels, a vast unnumbered throng, attend him on his way. The firmament, what's another word for firmament? Atmosphere. Atmosphere. The sky, the whole sky seems filled with radiant forms. What are the radiant forms? Angels. How much of the sky has got angels in it? It's filled. It's filled. 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. You can be sure that this most important event that's happened in salvation history, every angel is going to want to be part of it. So if someone says, oh, he's out there in the desert, you're going to say, hmm, I don't see any angels in the sky, right? So this business, some people, I've had big arguments, well, when, when, when the true Jesus comes down, his feet won't touch the ground. Forget that. If, he does, if he's not associated with a sky full of angels, it's not the right one. Just like that. End of discussion. Assuming you believe Ellen White. And that's, uh, no human pen can portray the scene, no mortal mind is adequate to conceive its splendor. Great controversy, page, the bottom of page 640 to the top of page 641. Well, and then... Yes. Well, when he came the first time, they missed him because they read in the Old Testament that he's coming as a king and so on and so forth. And so it seems natural to conclude, I'm kind of sympathetic in a way, with uh, those folks back then. Um, if it says he's going to come as a king then you're and set up a kingdom here and so on and so forth, that seems pretty literal. Yeah. So, and it didn't kind of, wasn't quite all that literal. That would be, I mean, there's no throne and all of that stuff. So, now we're reading this. Mm -hmm. How do we know when we read this and we interpret this literal, literally, that we're not making the same mistake that they made back then? How, you know, we say today, 2,000 years later, how in the world could the people have missed this and so on? Maybe in the future they'll be saying about us. How in the world could they have expected them to come like this? How could we have missed it when they, they should have known the, from the first time? The, the first people took it too literally. How do we, how do we, how do we, how do we know? Okay. It's, uh, anyway, there's my question. Because we're smarter. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but the, the, tru joke, the truth is that we have a lot more evidence laid out before us, a lot more clear picture. I don't know how God could have made it any clearer than he has. And we're not done. Let me read on. Amid the reeling of the earth, the flash of lightning, and the roar of thunder, the voice of the Son of God. I mean, is there going to be a disruption of things on this earth or what? Well, but this is Ellen White. This isn't in the book. Uh, oh, yeah, it is. Sure, amplifications. Well, but it's in the book. I mean, how, how, how much detail do you want? He looks upon the graves of the righteous, then raising his hands to heaven, he cries, Awake, 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 ye that sleep in the dust and arise through the length and breadth of the earth. The dead shall hear that voice. So I'm going to stop right there and say another clue about if it's the true Messiah, just walk over by Montecito. We have a graveyard just a little ways from here. If those graves are popping open and there's people coming up, you have a pretty good clue that that's the right one. Okay? So there are some clear evidence, assuming, once again, that you believe the writings of Ellen White. Well, I mean, of course, this is, this is clear. First Thessalonians 4 and other places in the Bible. These things this, are just... This is all biblical. Yeah, it's very biblical. It's all biblical. 
from the prison house of death they come, clothed with immortal glory, crying, and here's quoted from the scripture, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? 1 Corinthians 15, 55. And the living righteous and the ri risen saints unite their voices in a long, glad shout of victory. Great Controversy Now, page 644, paragraph 2. I think there's no doubt the devil's going to mimic this, but not on this magnitude. He's not, God's not, not going to allow him close. on that kind of a magnitude. No, no. But those who don't know any different. Yeah, exactly. Buy it. Well, why, why do we have Adventists? And like I said, I've been through many of these discussions myself. Why do Adventists, who have all this material in hand, or why are we arguing about whether or not his feet are going to touch the ground? Uh, I, I think it's kind of intellectual dishonesty. Let me put it that way. <laughs> well, can, this is confirmed by Jesus' own statement. Gordon, Jay, for the Son of Man will come like the lightning that flash, which flashes across the whole sky from the east to the west. Can you miss that? When it happens. I'm talking about beforehand. I'm talking about when it happens. I know, what if this all happens in China? No, why? Why? it says the entire sky is going to be full of shining angels. That's not just China. The whole world. And if they wants. say if they if they say you there's a million angels in China. Say, I'm waiting until they show Where, up here. Where's Jesus going to be? You know what? Jesus is going to figure out a way to make himself visible, one 360 degrees around this globe. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he will do it. Because what else do we see? Straight from Scripture. Look, he is coming in the clouds. Everyone, how many is that? Every eye. Will see him. Every eye, it says in the King James. Including those who pierced him. All peoples on earth. Does that say in China, or North America, Europe? All peoples on earth will mourn over him. So shall it be. They're going to mourn over him because they're not ready. But... They're going to warn because they what? They see him coming. Okay, try one more. Matthew twenty six sixty four. Jesus answered him, "So you say, but I tell all of you, this is while he's being tried by Caiaphas. I tell all of you, from this time on, you will see." This is the Sanhedrin seventy seventy one. I think it is Sanhedrin members. From this time on, you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right of the Almighty and coming on the clouds of heaven. I mean, how many more very definite comments do we need from God himself? So, Jay, at his first coming, Jesus appeared as a helpless baby boy to live a life apparently as an ordinary human being. But when he comes again, he will be surrounded by heavenly angels and his coming will be announced with the great sound of a trumpet. Matthew 24, 31, 25, 31, Revelation 19, 16. I mean, I don't know if we need to read all those verses. Satan will never be allowed to replicate such a coming. He will, he will for people who aren't familiar with Scripture, he will make a great show. And they'll say, wow, he's raising people from the dead. But what about the coming in the heavens with millions of angels? Uh, mm, I missed that part. Right? If someone tells you that Christ has appeared and you have not seen these signs, you can be sure it is a false coming. Do I dare be that definite? Well, Jesus not only promised to come back again, but also he gave us a number of signs to warn us how things will be at the end. Can you think of some? Now, he's not trying to say it's going to be on such and such a date. He's going to say, he's told us it will be after certain things happen. After what's happened? Seventh-day Adventists have been famous for their talk about one, the great Lisbon earthquake, which occurred on November 1 of 1755. That's a long time ago now. Two, the dark day and the moon turning to blood on May 19, 1780. Three, the falling of the stars on November 8, 13, 1833. It's going to happen after that. And then we have the 2300-day prophecy, which ended when? 1844, we know that it's not going to happen until after those promises, those prophecies. The last one ended in 1844. So the promises, the, the events which are described after that are not specifically limited 
or, or nailed to a specific date. They are what? They're general things that talk about conditions in the world or something. And a good example of that is 2 Timothy 3. I mean, we could read many, Matthew 24 in a number of places, but here's an example from 2 Timothy 3. Remember that there will be difficult times in the last days. People will be, now see if you've seen or heard of any people like any of this. People will be selfish, greedy, boastful, conceited. They will be insulting, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, and, are, and irreligious. They will be unkind, merciless, slanderers, violent and fierce. They will hate the good. They will be treacherous, reckless, and swollen with pride. They will love pleasure rather than God. They will hold to the outward form of religion, but reject its real power. Keep away from such people. Have anybody heard or seen anybody that might fit any of those descriptions? It's the whole world. Look outside. Look outside, <laughs> exactly. Um, we, we won't talk about looking inside, will we? <laughs> well, all these, what we know historically is that these predictions about the Lisbon earthquake, it wasn't named Lisbon, the great earthquake, about the dark day and about the stars falling from heaven, what did they result in? Searching the scriptures. Yes. They let a lot of people say, hey, look what it says right here in the Bible. We better, something must be happening, right? And so a lot of people suddenly woke up and said, something's happening. They started Bible societies and they started study groups and so forth. And what did that lead to? The, what's, what's known historically is the Great Awakening. And as we as Adventists know, it started the Millerite movement, which led to the Great Disappointment, which led to the formation of the Adventist Church, right? Well, we can always say, of course, that the second coming is never, ever farther away than what? Our own death. Our own death. At the, any point, if, we, if I should have a heart attack right now, and I die out right here on this chair on the floor, the next thing I would know would be second coming. the second coming, or hopefully not the third coming, at least a coming, right? I heard a minister narrow it down even a little closer than that. He said, your life is only the gap of time between one heartbeat to the next. Yeah. And it's true when you think of it. Most of us don't worry about it, not get out of bed over it, but yeah. it's the truth. Well, could Christ find us unprepared? Hopefully. Look at Matthew 24, 42 to 44. Be on your guard then, because you do not know what day your Lord will come. If the owner of a house knew the time when the thief would come, you can be sure that he would stay awake and not let the thief break into his house. So then you also must always be ready, because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you... Is it really say you? When you are not expecting him. Who's not expecting him? Does this say when half of the world is not going to be expecting him? Or a third of the world? Or only the Adventist church are expecting him? Doesn't say anything like that, does it? How, how can that be when there is supposed to be so much culminate? Now, prior to a little bit ago, you were arguing just the opposite. What's happened here in this argument? Well, I think it is going on all around us. The danger is we yeah. get used to it. Yeah. Certainly what happened. But happened. there are, you know, there are, at least we teach and believe there are certain prophetic Absolutely. things that are supposed to come about. Yeah. So how can it be a surprise? Well, let, well, let's be fair now. Let's be fair. Suppose we walk out of here tonight and we go to a mall or something like that. And we walk in and we meet somebody that we, even maybe somebody we know, but who's not Christian, knows virtually nothing about the Bible, and you've got 15 minutes to convince him that Jesus is coming again soon, what would you say? This guy knows nothing, he, you know, he's a secular person, he's known nothing about Christianity, nothing about the Bible, and you've got 15 minutes to convince him that Christ is coming again. 15 minutes? That long? What five seconds? <laughs> <laughs> what would you do? What would you do in five seconds? It seems to me a bit, 
I've, this is something I've pondered, and I have a neighbor that I talk to, and he reckons that Christianity is all, well, I'll censor it. I won't tell you what he calls it. Yeah. His wife's different. But um, I think it's like Christ told the disciples, which is the greatest commandment, and he said, love God and love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. If you did that, that would take up 15 minutes, and I think you'd get the basics. You could get elsewhere, but that's what it comes down to. Yeah, and I agree with you. You're talking about how we should, what we should do to get ready. I asked a slightly different question, which is, that one's a very important question. I asked the question, how would you convince this person, whether he believes or not, I mean, I'm not trying to tell him how to get ready. I'm saying, how would you, what would you say to somebody, I want to convince you in the next 15 minutes that Jesus Christ is coming back? I've seen in <coughs> populated urban areas, there's... Um, the guy standing usually yelling that you're going to burn forever if you don't repent right now. And that gets some people's attention. Yeah. Uh, but how do you do it in uh, a different manner with more calmness? I run a lot of marathons. I, I like running and I've run a number of marathons. And you can almost guarantee at the start of a marathon when there's <laughs> thousands of people starting down the road, there'll be people holding signs, you know, repent and so forth and so forth. Yeah. Well. A good message. <laughs> I hope he's not telling us to repent from our running. If you if you knew the person and you knew something about their personality, there might be something that you personally knew that you could home in on that might tip the edge one way or another. What was your question again? <laughs> if you had somebody, in, uh, take an hour if you want. How would you convince a secular person living in the United States in 2014 that Jesus is coming back? No, I'm not sure. Test. I'm not sure. You know, the Holy Spirit, I think, does the convincing. So we just sit back and watch him do it? Well. If the guy has <laughs> questions, or if he's, if he's not satisfied with, with the answers he's been given, you might have a ch fighting chance. But if he's happy where he's at. Get somebody walking in to seize candy, I'm not sure. That's the challenge. I don't know. Hit him happened. over the head with your. Well, why don't you repent just, board? Or? Why don't you just tell him, you just wait, he'll come. And when he does, he'll come, and then they'll find out. What if is the difference that, between it, that and me telling him something? If we could do it in 15 minutes, why? We should be doing it, right? This We'd be done and out of here. <laughs> <laughs> well, well Paul, Paul and Silas <laughs> convinced the Corinthian jailer in a lot less time than that. That's yeah. Right. But that jailer was open That's for right. the for the but message. How do you, how do you but you're like he's talking about somebody that isn't open for it. The Philippian jailer. Yeah, the Philippian jailer. But what but how do you know he or she isn't? That's why I was getting at earlier. Yeah. If you could throw it in their court, but they may ask you something, or you could ask them a leading question. For instance, now the Bible says wars, rumors of wars famines, pestilences. Mm -hmm. It goes on. This is getting into what we were talking about earlier. It's happening right now. Look at the Middle East. What, what would people say if you prepared it, you took a news, a few, maybe a week's worth of newspapers, and you took a biblical prophecy, and you know, I'm sure in a week you could pick something out of that newspaper or something off of the internet for that matter. Okay, here it's fulfilled. And here's another promise from the Bible, there it's fulfilled. Here's another promise from the Bible, there it's fulfilled. You could you could, you could even bring up the great controversy. You can cover a lot of ground in a few minutes with that. Well, but you know, they did those kinds of things. Adventists did those kinds of things prior to World War I when things were caving in. And then along came World War II <coughs> and you saw Hitler and all of that stuff. And uh, oh, the end of the world, this is, this is here. And mm -hmm. I so don't think it's increasing. You can't avoid the fact anyone that's got any sense of news within this be it a radio or paper these days it's increased tremendously yeah. in our lifetime second <laughs> peter three i think answers yeah. some of that question yeah. you know it, it, there's people who are just they're too minds too uh, preoccupied yeah. with other stuff it's so easy to become so caught up in our work our daily activities of various kinds and our personal pursuits our pursuit to be rich or whatever it happens to be have time to prepare for the second coming. And so we just sort of put it off. And the devil doesn't care if we believe in the second coming, no, no. just so long as we're not ready. Sitting on just 
delay. You know, it sounds like an awful lot of works to me. You have to I didn't get about ready. Work. Well, you're saying you have to do stuff. To, you have to get ready. You, if you're not ready now, then you have to get ready, which means that's working at something. It, well, we are pointing to ourselves a lot. You've got to admit that. And this whole discussion is. Okay. But I'm thinking about the, the rock that went after the image and mm -hmm. broke it into millions of pieces. And the Bible says it was not made of human hands. Daniel too. So here we are talking about us pro putting off Jesus' coming. And yet there's that prophecy mm -hmm. of a rock that came down that completely out of our ability to make happen and, it, and the Bible says it was God that did it not and, us. Okay. And well. at the same time primarily from Ellen White as we find that in those last days the Holy Spirit and it withdraws and withdraws and withdraws and lets things get worse and worse. Well let what me, I'm uh, hearing is that we just need to sit back and not do anything because it might be works. No, I'm not saying we need to sit back and do anything. I'm just not sure what I'm supposed to be doing. Well, here's some examples. Let's, let's, let's take some examples from the writings of Ellen White. And, and those of you who don't think we should be primarily quoting her, she says so many very pertinent things about this that it's hard for me to imagine why we would leave any of these things out. I start off with Second Testimonies, Volume 2 of the Testimonies, page 194, written in 1868. The long night of gloom is trying, but the morning is deferred in mercy, because if the Master should come, so many would be found unready. God's unwillingness to have His people perish has been the reason of so long delay. You know, it's that image of unready. Mm -hmm. That's what is that? Is it is it not knowing enough of the Bible? Is it not is it not um, doing enough prayer? Is it well, um, not? There are, th there are only there are only three, and and some people divide one of them up into two. There's only really three things that the Bible tells us to do. And Jay is talking about things to do. One is Bible study. The second thing is prayer. And the third thing is what we sometimes call witnessing. Um, basically, it's talking to people about what we have learned from what we've read and what we've learned the, what, what, from our personal experience from the Holy Spirit. So those are the, that, that's, that's what we can do. So that's, that's your ingredients for ready. That's, my, that's, well, that's how you're it, looking at it. And that, if you want to put that all together, it's developing a personal loving relationship with God based on, and, and that love, personal loving relationship with God is described as faith. Or if you, if you, if you will, belief, but trust, trust is probably the best word in, in the English language today. Getting to the place where, and here's the challenge. We, day by day, think that what we want to do is more important than what God wants us to do. And so we, we, we are daily choosing to do our way instead of his way. That's and called self-centeredness. Yeah. Well, that, that's the that's, first sin that's, everybody that's commits. That's the devil's plan. <laughs> we know we're going to get judged on the levels of what God knows that we were exposed to. And it's not just those of us here. This is Christianity or humanity worldwide. Yep. We know there'll be some get to heaven that may get there before us because mm -hmm. we've been lazy and these people weren't exposed to it. Well, let me try some more from Ellen White. This one was written in 18, that one, 1868, that's only 24 years after the Great Disappointment and only five years after the Seventh-day Adventist Church was first organized. Five years. And Ellen White's talking about great delay. The angels of God in their messages to men represent time as very short. Thus it has always been presented to me. It is true that time has continued longer than we, than we expected in the early days of this message. Our Savior did not appear as soon as we ho hoped. But has the word of the Lord failed? 
Never. It should be remembered that the promises and the threatenings of God are alike conditional. We talked about that a little earlier. Had Adventists, now think about what group we're talking about here, had Adventists after the Great Disappointment in 1844, were they members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? No. no. Didn't exist. Adventist Church, as we know it today, did not exist in 1844. But those, the believers in the Second Advent, held, if they had held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit proclaiming it to the world, they would have seen the salvation of God, the Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts, the work would have been completed and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people to their reward. That's 39 years after the Great Disappointment. That's Evangelism, page 695. Going on, the wickedness, talking about other, and we're just talking about a variety of things that, that sort of sort of bring the picture home. The wickedness of the inhabitants of the world has almost filled up the measure of their iniquity. This earth has almost reached the place where God will permit the destroyer to work his will upon it. God is going to allow who to do what? The, the devil. The devil to try to destroy it. The light going on. The light that was to lighten the whole earth with his glory. Now this is a very scary passage. It's found in, in one, volume one of Selected Messages, page two. This is actually the bottom of 234 and the top of 235, but there's a three or four page chapter there that you need to read the whole thing. The light that was to lighten the whole earth with its glory. What would that be? That's the, those are the words right out of Revelation 18, verse 1. And we usually associate that with the latter rain. That's what's described, what we describe as the latter rain. So Which means? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit just before the second coming of Christ. What happens when that happens? Well, God's Spirit comes down, works with those people who are ready, and the Gospel goes with the power and that it went similar to the way it was done on, at Pentecost in the former reign with Peter and the other apostles preaching. That thing is going to happen again on a much larger scale, worldwide scale. So that can't happen unless we're ready? Unless we're ready. But, but doesn't, when the Holy Spirit comes down, doesn't that doesn't that give us what we need? Well, let me read the rest of the sentence, okay. okay? The light that was, I'm going to read it again, the light that was light in the whole earth with its glory was resisted, past tense, and by the action of our own brethren has been in a great degree kept away from the world. What was she talking about? It turns out she was talking about the 1888 General Conference where the General Conference brethren were meeting. And then she goes on to describe it. The Law of Ten Commandments is not to be looked upon as much from the prohibitory side as from the mercy side. Its prohibitions are the sure guarantee of happiness in obedience. As received in Christ, it works in us the purity of character that will bring joy to us through eternal ages. So it means some, it has something to do with the way we look at God's law, it has something to do with the way we relate to God. <clears throat> it has a great deal to do with our picture of God. What, what does it mean by the mercy side of the law? Well, okay. Um, I don't know whether I should wait and read you a couple more quotations. The, well, let me, let, let's do this. What would the mercy side of the law mean? It means that now we look at the law and it's very easy for us to say do not, you know, don't do this, don't do that, don't do the, the last six commandments, okay? Or five commandments anyway. All the all, things you can't. All the, don't, all the things you're not supposed to do, okay. okay? But why are those commands there? What they're really saying to us is God is preparing a kingdom and he would like to take all of us there. He would like everyone to be in a condition to be fit to be a part of that kingdom. But he knows that he can't let us all, all the whole inhabitants of this world into that kingdom because what would happen? 
would start all over again. The great controversy would start all over. We wouldn't accomplish anything. The, we, the, the problem would just continue on. So God says, I can only allow into my kingdom people who have looked at this, they've thought about it long enough, and they've said, I choose not to do any of those sinful things because they damage me, they don't fit with God's kingdom, they, and so forth. And so God says, I can only admit to my kingdom people who have made that kind of a decision. So let me read a few more quotations. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, this is another thing that happens just at the very end, the sealing, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Why doesn't God allow Satan do his thing right now? Because we're not settled into the truth. We're not settled into the truth. We have not, we don't understand it clearly enough. If the devil shows up right now, this far from your face, and says thus and so, will we be able to say that's not true because it doesn't agree with the Bible? You know, that, that question goes on forever, though. Mm -hmm. No matter how much you study, no matter how much you do things, no matter how perfect you think you become, that, that problem's still there. So well, but the, what good is that for us? Well, other than, other than to stay yeah. humble. <laughs> yeah, well, if, if it's in that department of what God is looking for, mm -hmm. and if you haven't been doing any of it, I think your chances of getting in the pearly gates are pretty low. But well, if you've God really been there. working toward it, it says, in the end, God says, those that are good, let them be good still. Those that are filthy, let them be filthy still. We're supposed to be trying to get ourselves lined up knowing what we've been taught and read and studied over the years. If we know what God is looking for. Yeah. That's what you said. Let so me read about that. Because we're basically how would you know that? We're running out of we're running out of time sure here. Are. But let me let me just read you a quotation. I'm getting I'm full of quotations today. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. He's doing what? He's waiting. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that every single individual is going to be a complete example of Christ, but as a people, we're going to be. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.12 Were all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly... The whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly, the last great harvest would be ripened, and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. Christ Object Lessons 69, 1 and 2. Oh, now is that the Adventist or is that the remnant? I was just going to comment. I think it's all Christians at the end time around the world, not just Adventists, this other it's, people. It's God's people wherever they are. That's right. But hopefully, we want to be a part of that group. So we need to get ourselves ready, right? Of course, we all know that the world laughs at the idea that Christ is coming again. They don't want to believe that God even exists, let alone. I mean, I don't know what those people are going to say as Jesus appears in the sky and comes down and it gets brighter and better and suddenly the whole sky is full of angels. They're going to say, no, I don't think God exists. You know? Special effects movie. There's this is a... Of that. <laughs> well, you know, they say there were no atheists in foxholes. Yeah. I was going to say, there might be a good touch of terror here and there, I think. Could it be true that we might be a part of the reason for the delay? If we are, what are we waiting for? Hopefully, just we've just touched on the materials here, but there hopefully is no question left in the minds of any Christian about God's promise to come back, that he will come again, and a pretty good picture of what conditions are going to be like just before that time happens. Well, Jesus is patiently longing for us to get ready. Of course, we know that there will be trouble sometime before the second coming actually occurs. So I, now I have a question for you, and we've got just a little time left, so don't spend a long time thinking about this. <laughs> Why is it necessary for Christians to go through all these troubles on this earth to prepare us 
to live in a, a place where there will be no troubles. Does that make any sense to you? Focuses our attention on higher things. Well, um, the place that has no trouble is you're, you're contingent on on that happening. On the why there's trouble here? You don't want any more up there. When when you're when you're when you're in real trouble, <clears throat> um, and you're, you're tested, okay. it's far easier for not only you to see, but others to see what you're made of, than when you aren't in trouble. Okay. We don't we don't identify true heroes until there's something that calls that heroism out of them. In our lesson, and we don't have time to go through this in detail, there are three different, there's a description of three different groups that talk about the end of this world. There are a group we call the post-millennialists who think that the world is going to have a thousand years of wonderful time and then Jesus is going to come. There's another group called the amillennialists and those people believe that the whole thing is just a sort of a metaphor for for th the history of the Christian church, basically, so forth. It's not anything too serious. Then there's a final group which is really sort of divided into two. They are called the premillennialists. That means that Jesus is going to come at the beginning of the thousand years. And some of those people are called dispensationalists, and others are called historicists. The dispensationalists believe that there's, and this, there's variations of this, but they believe that some people are going to be raptured, and there's going to be a, se a seven-year period of real problems, and then Jesus is going to come. That's one group. But the historical uh, millennialists, like Seventh-day Adventists, believe that there is going to be trouble. Jesus is going to come the second time. Then there's going to be a thousand years of waste here on this earth while the, righteous, the, the wicked are dead and the righteous are taken to heaven to view everything that's happened and so forth. And then Jesus will come back to remake this earth into a beautiful new Garden of Eden. And I would like to suggest that if you want to look at the scriptures, it's only that last view that's consistent with all of the scripture pictures. And I hope that that means that all of you will think about it. Thank you.